Good morning, everyone. Great attitude. We knew the trick. We give some good food in the morning and everyone's smiling. That's how you do it. Thank you all for coming. We are having a wonderful, wonderful uh, weekend with uh, Rabbi Asher Crisp. We started off with a Friday night dinner right up here in this room. We had a wonderful response and show. And it's good to see a lot of you came back. Rabbi, that means you're doing a very good job. They came back. You know, we could, <laughs> we could advertise and we could paint a pretty picture and everyone comes, but if they don't come the second time, you know, they came back. Baruch Hashem. Uh, this event was generously sponsored by Captain Tad and Liz Stern. Thank you so much for uh, making this happen. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Rabbi Asher Chris. There'll be a low pressure system coming in. Uh, <laughs> 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 Anyway, today's class is uh, about uh, anxiety relief and to try to articulate an uh, authentic theory of how to diagnose and treat anxiety, to self-diagnose and to self-treat one's anxiety uh, as we see it coming out of the Torah tradition. And uh, if you don't know what anxiety is, I'd like to paint the following image in your mind. Uh, I'm flying my four kids from Israel. I'm getting on the plane. I have 16 carry-ons. <laughs> I don't fit through first class. I get stuck in the aisle. Eventually we're seated. It's my wife, myself, my four kids, two air marshals. <laughs> you, know, you, you can imagine you know, what's going on. You know, the horror, the shock, the you know, self-image issues that I was ever going. But anyway, no, you get the idea that the anxiety is something most common. Everyone that deals with anxiety, sometimes on a very constant basis, sometimes on a semi-regular basis, sometimes almost never at all. Um, apparently, in my home state of Vermont, they haven't heard of it. They don't know what it is because there, there's nothing to be. I mean, it's kind of that bovine general serenity that uh, walks through the Green Mountain State. That, uh, but we're not really sure which century it is, let alone whether we should be anxious. Uh, but anxiety is a very dominant uh, feature in uh, in people's person personal and private lives, and uh, we want to try to see where does it speak about it in the Hebraic Bible. So we go to one of the most fascinating books that gives a lot of practical tips on how to uh, navigate life's greater challenges, which is the book of Proverbs, say for Mishle. And there is the most important verse in the entire Hebraic Bible regarding the phenomenon of anxiety, which we are going to dissect. And this, word, this verse reads, That anxiety in the heart of man, or in the heart of a human being, will deject it, will depress the heart. Devarto v'yasamchena means, and a good word will make it uplift it, will gladden it, make it happy once again. So this verse has a number of interesting grammatical ambiguities that actually capture not one, but a, but three, three individual therapeutic approaches to anxiety, which should not be seen as three separate therapies, but rather a three-step program. We don't need 12 steps when we can have three, right? Simplicity is of, is of great concern, especially when you have a lot of anxiety. I can't, might get nervous with 12 steps. <laughs> three steps, right? That's better. So we have, we have, we have this verse, that first of all, it tells us what is the resultant feature of anxiety. In fact, that's the linear way of reading the verse. Uh, however, Hebrew has a very strange quality uh, of it because not necessarily is the syntactic order of the verse one of cause and then effect. Sometimes it can be read the other way around. So the normative way of reading this verse is da'aga belevish. Da'aga means anxiety in the heart of a human being. So that's the locale. That's where it strikes us in our uh, emotional epicenter. So the heart becomes emblematic of not just all my emotional states, but my general uh, sensitivity and self-awareness of how I'm doing, 
It also becomes the playground of my inspiration, right? That's all the heart. So da'aga, uh, da anxiety, attacks the heart, which is going to then filter out to the rest of the body. That's where, where it's really impacting me. And then the consequence of that is this word yashchena, which we're going to uh, place a lot of emphasis on. Usually the word yashchena is translated as in the commentary of Rashi, the biblical commentator par excellence, as yashpilena, which means to lower. So what's the lowering? It's the lowering of my emotional sensitivity. It's lowering my, my uh, inspiration in my heart, lower, lower emotive energy, lower confidence. My heart is falling, it's failing. That's the image of what anxiety can do to a person. It's somewhat close to the notion of depression. It's not identical to in Torah literature, but it's very close. Like there's something depressing in the heart that comes as a result of the anxiety. So that's because of anxiety, you will have this depressing of the heart, this lowering of our emotional states, lowering of our inspiration, lowering of our, our, our uh, self-image, all of those kinds of seemingly negative things that are read. However, sometimes we read this in an entirely different order. We read it from the, the symptom, we talk about the condition, and then the resultant factor here is not really the result of that condition, but rather the cure for the condition. So in a certain sense, you, 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 you meet a sword with another sword, you fight fire with fire, you fight what normally anxiety would do to you by doing the same thing to anxiety. It's only fair. If, <laughs> if anxiety is going to make me uptight, I'll make anxiety uptight, right? That I'll, I'll, I'll have my revenge in that way. So instead we read it, if a person experiences anxiety in their hearts, yashchena, lower it, meaning not lower your hearts. It doesn't, yashchena doesn't refer back to belevish in the heart of a human being. Rather, it refers back to the da'aga, to the anxiety. It's a very interesting that, that, that Hebrew is a language that allows for this kind of syntactic ambiguity. So that means that I want to lower, if I experience anxiety, I need to lower the level of, of anxiety. Well, how do I lower the level of anxiety lest it lower my emotive level, get me down? <coughs> how do I do that? So paradoxically, I, I use somewhat of a homeopathic notion vis-a-vis -vis the anxiety. If, if the anxiety is going to get me down, sometimes the way to avoid it is to get myself down before the anxiety can get me down. It sounds a little bit paradoxical. In other words, I'm going to create the feigned conditions within my own psychological landscape that emulate the, the symptoms of the illness or what anxiety would normally cause to me, I'm going to pretend that that's going on with me already, and then it will overlook my, me as a target. It'll just kind of avoid me and keep on trucking, as we say. So what, is, what does that look like? That is because anxiety is usually triggered by the huge gap, the distance, the abyss that yawns between where I am and where I would like to be or where I am and where I project myself to be, my sense of expectation versus the apparent results. So what, what does that uh, reflect? Very often, we are a creature, a human being, that uh, doesn't just live in the present. The characteristic of, of uh, human existence is our endless quest to always be ahead of ourselves. We like to get ahead of ourselves. What am I going to do? later today? What am I going to do tomorrow? What will I do in five years? What will I do when I pay off my mortgage? Right? For, it, it depends how far ahead of yourself you want to get. I, I always say childhood was the best two weeks of my life. <laughs> and after that, I was already planning out uh, which country club I would join and uh, you know, where I would retire, of course, and all of these kinds of things I, at a very early age. Right? So sometimes we get very far ahead of ourselves. And we, we, we construct the mo road map to life. And uh, if life doesn't bring us a, uh, a bill of goods that's uh, exactly like we in thought we had anticipated was going to be delivered, so we start to suffer from this anxious state of feeling like there's a dichotomy opening here. I'm not where I thought I was going to be. 
that my, the pace of my career is not taking me where I think I should be. I, I haven't reached those life goals. I, ha I, haven't, uh, I haven't broken certain, uh, certain benchmarks in terms of what I've set myself. I haven't become what my parents want me to be. Right? So there's many, many different things that can fuel the distance between where I am and where I project into the future, getting ahead of myself where I might want to be. And it's very interesting that if we, if we crystallize that image of our future, so not just looking into a crystal ball, but now I've actually made this uh, crystal statue that it's perfectly transparent where I will be in the future. It could be five minutes in the future, five years in the future, 50 years in the future, and that's what I'm going to look like. That's what life will look like. That's what my life will look like. And I will be a fill in the blank. I will be a doctor because my mother wanted me to be a doctor. Even though I wanted to be a lumberjack, I'm a doctor, right? You know, I, I, I have to fill that role, whatever it might be. So that, that, that gulf that opens up the chasm between expectation and reality is what we call the, the, the point of departure from which all anxiety springs. And it can be your sense of expectation just on an airline flight. Like, I would not like my kids to commandeer the aircraft. That would not be good, right? That, thank God they have those barricade doors now for the pilots, or who knows where we would land, right? Probably candy land. But uh, th that's, 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 a, that's a basic expectation of what the experience of flying should be like. And if my experience was somewhat less enjoyable because I walked from Israel going up and down the aisle with my kids, right? So uh, it means that it broke with expectation. So the way this is ex explained in Kabbalistic literature is as follows. The word ani, which in Hebrew is the first person pronoun, refers to the I, the self is striking in that the three letters in Hebrew that spell this word, Aleph, Nun, and Yud, can be permutated to spell another Hebrew word. And this is one of the classic teachings of the Kabbalistic text, the Zohar. I don't know that many people have heard of the Zohar. It's a commentary on the five books of Moses, the Torah proper. And one of the teachings that it likes to emphasize is the, the fact that the word Ani, self, or the I, can be permutated from Aleph Nun Yud to Aleph uh, Yud Nun, just changing the two second and third letters, just changing those around. And it spells the word Ayin. Ayin means nothingness. But it's interpreted very often in Kabbalistic literature to mean no thingness, not a thing, not a specific thing, not an object. It's not an objectified state yet. It hasn't been bronzed and ossified and hardened into the, the shell outline of, of a self projected into the future. I haven't created an idol out of my own future, like hewn of stone, right? This is what it's going to be. It's already very solid what I will look like, where I will be, what I am doing, right? So that, 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 that's very often the, the sense of the thing the yesh, as it's sometimes called in Kabbalistic literature. It's a, it's a true something. It's this designated something. And yesh also means, and particularly in modern Hebrew, yesh uh, de if I have money, right? It ha has uh, another secondary meaning, which is having, possession. Like this is an attribute or something predicated of me that I possess. I am fill in the blank, funny, uh, serious, organized, spontaneous, right? Those are all predicates. That I, that I have. So in the future, it might be something like, oh, say, successful. I have a future, I will be successful. But success is defined as eclipsing Bill Gates in, you know, whatever it might be, right? And right now, he's making twice what I make in a month. So, you know, I'm somewhat disappointed. But uh, in any event, in any event, that is the, the something. Like, I want to be a something, but not just an anything, because my projection is already carved out. You know, it's been uh, laser sculpted exactly what that something will be. But the, so the, the cure for that is to actually take the ani, this crystallized sense of self, and revert it back into the I and the no thingness. It's not a thing, meaning it's in an amorphous state. In fact, the Rishonim, which is a period of, of rabbinics that approximately runs from the year 900 to the year 1200, Actually, you can take it all the way much further to about 1492, uh, actually, is sometimes the conclusion of that period. Uh, this period of rabbinics 
very often borrowed and actually uh, converted a, he uh, a Greek word into Hebrew is a common practice you see in Talmudic literature, which is the word heuli. Heuli means, in a, a, a hyalic matter means like an amorphous substance. It's like a formless mass. Like there's raw potential materials there, but they haven't gotten their form yet. So they could be all kinds of things. I've left open many windows of possibility, and it's a very elastic state that it exists. So very often we're told that the Hebrew word ayin should be understood in translation by the Greek word hiuli. In fact, most amazingly, if you write the word hiuli, this amorphous or formless stuff, in Hebrew, its numerical value is 61, which equals the Hebrew word ayin, if you turn all the letters into numbers. So they actually are equivalences. So what that means is that the nothing is not literal nothingness, but rather, that by the way we have a different term for it, that's called ephes, which means zero, what my bank account currently looks like. <laughs> uh, no, nothing, nothing is an amorphous state, right? It's, it's not predefined, it's not preconditioned in any way. And that's opening my future to the widest spectrum of possibilities. So the, one of the ways of lowering the anxiety is actually to lower the self, but what does it mean to lower the self? It means to lower the sense of self that I'm projecting ahead into the future. I'm lowering my self-expectations. I set myself up for some impossible goals, right? I, I decided that, uh, you know, in, in midlife I'd like to start doing some exercise and I think that if I train hard I might be able to win the Tour de France more times than Lance Armstrong. Okay, I'm giving myself very high expectations. <laughs> Right? And I might suffer tremendous anxiety if I can't even turn pro as a result of it. But nonetheless, I have these very grandiose ideas. Right? Sometimes we do this not just to ourselves, but to other people. And that becomes the source of anxiety. Who will I marry? Well, I don't want to marry a person. I want to marry an idea. Because my idea of that ideal person, they, do, they think like me, they act like me. But only when I act the way I, I want them to act like that. Not like the way I act all the time, or the dark side of myself, or whatever that might be. And, and, and they look as good as me when I look really good, but not when I look bad. Right? And you, you, you can continue to fill out the blanks. But that's also stamping another person with even uh, a sense of how they should be in the present that's very definitive. This sense of self, as opposed to allowing the possibilities to be uh, very wide ranging. And part of even being able to be compatible with someone for a long period of time, even if that's someone that you're being compatible with, is you. Because you have to be married to yourself on a certain level, especially between your soul and your body. We're told that the, the body-soul duality is like a marriage. And the soul is very often like the chatan, the masculine principle, the body is the kala. Very often it says, uh, beto zu ishto, that one's wife or one's spouse, that's particularly one's wife, is one's house. So the inner Kabbalistic meaning of that is that the body is literally the house to the soul. Not that one's wife is in the house, but is the concept of house. So obviously, wherever the soul goes in the body, you're always at home, right? Because you're always in your house, hopefully. Unless you're having out-of-body experiences, and then I can't help you. <laughs> it's, it's too Kabbalistic, too Kabbalistic, too mystical. I, I'm not old enough to understand those things. So that, that's, that's, that's a different problem. So whether it be between us and ourselves or between us and others, this, this uh, tension that can create anxiety is one of a dialectic between the ani and the ayin, between a definitive sense of self and the kind of uh, amorphous state of potential that allows great latitude and flexibility of what I may be able to become. And that's why, in fact, uh, the sages tell us in the Tal Talmud, liolam yehe adam raka kanava lo kasha ka'aras, that a person should also always be pliable like a reed and not stiff and rigid like a cedar tree. The, the image being that the reed, of course, will flex in any direction the wind blows, but it won't become uprooted and it's not prone to breaking. Whereas the rigidity of the cedar tree is one that it stays upright, aggressively holding its ground to any force, especially gale force winds coming out of the door, <laughs> yeah, uh, to, to bother it, uh, that it will not it will not give whatsoever. But when it does give, it's not just gonna it's not gonna give by bending. It's gonna give by breaking. 
it'll snap in half, it may become uprooted. So the consequences are very uh, profound. So the, the difference, if, if I have a very definitive sense of the ani, the I, this is me, this is my sense of self, and that includes projections of where I should be, that, I, I, that I, when, I, when I went to school I thought the, that I would continue with my uh, varsity cow tipping my whole life, and I actually got out of the sport because there aren't enough cows in, in Philadelphia where I live close by to tip them over while they sleep, but I don't do that. So, so not, then we have to be open to different things, living different places, uh, have, having different friends, different neighbors that, that uh, live next to you, and all, all these new challenges that you don't ever expect. So that's, that's stage number one. That's lowering the anxiety by lowering oneself. But lowering oneself really means lowering the sense of self-expectations that they're so definitive that the roadmap is not able to be redrawn, that I'm not willing to accept. Of course, we make a tentative schedule as we go, right? There are different extremes to this. Uh, in fact, that's beautifully articulated by two students of the Baal Shem Tov. He had two chassidim that were very close to him. And they were good friends themselves, despite the, self, uh, despite the fact that they were antithetical in their personality. One would say that on this day, on this hour, two years from now, I know exactly what I'm going to be doing. He, he had it all in his Palm Pilot. Right? I know exactly two hours, from, two years from now, this day, this minute, I know what I'll be doing. It's on my schedule. I'll be getting my nails done. And the other one said, I don't know what I'm going to be doing today five minutes from now. And yet they were friends and they were both the sidim of the same rabbi. They somehow both got along. Well, obviously those are two radical extremes. So you might say, well, okay, on the one hand it's good to plan for the future. On the other hand, I have to be able to have what's called hora'at sha'ah. It's the instruction of the hour. When I see that certain things come in my way, I might not continue my plan. So if I decide to go drive through Kansas and there's a tornado warning, I might say, well, I'm going on vacation no matter what. Even though I see the tornado is coming down the road at me, I'm not turning around, right? I'm going on vacation. Right? So we, 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 we expect the unexpected now. More increasingly, we, we learn, hopefully, if we're going to lower our anxiety, to, to build in a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, even a few other blank spaces for plans that you may not have yet thought of. So that's, that's, that's stage number one. All of that is just stage number one. And that's about trying to suppress the anxiety by suppressing my innate tendency to want to already carve out a crystal clear picture of where I need to be at any given moment, especially the future. Stage number one. Stage number two has to do with the Talmudic variant of reading this word, yashchena, which itself we said meant yashbilena, to lower the quality of the anxiety. This particular level has to do with just switching the vocalization of this Hebrew word. The whole of the Hebraic Bible is written with the 22 Hebrew letters as consonants, but with the absence of vowels. We have to appeal to the oral tradition to properly vocalize these texts. So in the absence of vowels, you can imagine that the same word may be read a number of different ways. There's a kind of polyvalency, there's a polyvalence, rather, to an, uh, all Hebrew words because of this ambiguity. And what that means is that if you just imagine the, the, a three-letter word in a crossword puzzle, first letter is H, last letter is T, so what, what word does it spell? It could be, if you put the vowel letter in, hot or hit or what hat or what, you have a number of possibilities. Same with Hebrew. So we have, we have a Masoretic reading, which is the traditional reading of a text, which is Yashchena to lower, and I'm, I'm getting a sign from on high, uh, <laughs> to lower the volume of what, no, no, uh, of, this, of the cell phone. Uh, the, you have to expect the unexpected. <laughs> so, uh, so to lower the anxiety, but another way of reading it would be to take the shin, we read yashchena, and make it a sin. So it becomes, actually it's read like this, lashen hesek hadat, which means to remove from your mind, yashchena uh, medato, to remove it from your consciousness. If I have anxiety, instead of suppressing the anxiety through suppressing this tendency of myself to carve out my future, I'm now going to ignore the anxiety or push it out of my mind. And the image that's given of this, ignoring the anxiety, you say, oh, nice for you to say, 
you're not the one dealing with all the worry, right? Ah, you're just going to pull it out of your mind. And that's great. That's why I just, I just never open my mail. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to ignore all the anxiety. Bills, I toss them immediately. Uh, that's the, how do you do that? I mean, it's, it sounds very nice to uh, just say that, but really, what do you do practically? So the image that's given is of Yosef. Yosef uh, is sold by his brothers, of course, and he gets placed in a pit as the Torah recurs. He's put down in this pit, and this is a rather unusual pit because this particular pit, not, not my living room, this particular pit <laughs> is, is said to be an empty pit. Bor reich she'en bo mayim, the Torah says. It's an empty pit, has no water in it. So of course Rashi chimes in with the most logical question, well, if it's empty, why do you have to say there's no water? But okay. then he complicates things further. It's like, don't you love when the response just like is worse than the question that you originally had? <laughs> this complicates the issue. So Rashi says, Mayim einbo ela nachashim ba'achrevim yeshbo. That there is no water in it, however, it does have snakes and scorpions. That wasn't what I was looking for. It says it's an empty pit, so why did it have to continue and tell me there's no water? And now you've really made it bad because you're telling me, oh, in fact, there is no water in it. Okay, that's the emptiness, but it does have snakes and scorpions, which would mean that it is not empty. Not empty. Okay, hang on, what's going on? <laughs> so I have two, two, this is a rather unusual pit. It has two different states that define it. If it's full, it must mean that it has water, by definition. If it's empty, it means, empty means it has snakes and scorpions. So what's going on? Obviously a highly unusual pit. We can't have a normal pit. That would be too easy. That wouldn't have the proper amount of anxiety attached to it <laughs> we expect from Jewish learning, right? So what, what we do is we, we, we look into the inner mystical tradition of Hasidic philosophy and Kabbalah, and we discover that this pit is none other than our minds, our consciousness, which is a receptacle for all kinds of things that we tend to throw in it or dump in it. Well, hopefully no dumping is allowed, right? We we'll only put things that are environmentally healthy for the mind in the mind. But sometimes we do dump stuff in there. And the two alternatives for the mind are either water or snakes and scorpions. If the mind is filled, if it fills full, if you put meaningful things in your mind, it's called Ein Mayim Ela Torah. There is no water image other than that of the Torah. The water becomes a symbol of Torah itself, and by extension for all wisdom, for all learning. So if you, if you put meaningful thoughts if you put Torah thoughts, if you fill your mind with wisdom, that's a filled mind. The pit is full and it has water. And therefore, it automatically gets rid of the snakes and scorpions. If the mind is empty wow. through indolence, if I'm not doing anything with my mind, the intellectually lazy, I'm not trying to always stimulate my mind, it automatically will become a breeding ground for negative psychic phenomenon that we call snakes and scorpions. And what are the snakes and scorpions that come from the absence of anything to think about? Anxieties, right? Because I, I need to fill it with something, so I'm going to start to worry, right? I'm going to start to like see, you know, because I have nothing better to do, so I, I start to see how everything can go wrong, how everything might be a problem, how everyone drives me crazy, right? How, how hell is other people, as Jean-Paul Sartre likes to say, right? The, 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 all these kinds of things start to, to uh, propagate in my empty mind. And what do they really represent? The, the term snake, nachash, in the Hebrew, has a very interesting uh, connotation. It means to guess. So if my mind is playing a guessing game, you know, somebody gave me a look. I think they gave me a look. And then I start, I start thinking in my mind, I'm guessing what's going on. Why were they looking? They're a looker. That person, they give me that look. Maybe they were telling me that I have no sense of style. <laughs> right? Maybe they were telling me that I'm a loser or whatever it is. Do that look. What was that? And I start to, like, and pretty soon I'm constructing elaborate conversations uh, between me and this other per person worthy of Shakespeare, right? These whole inner exchange. Well, my part, I would say to them that you are blah, 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 blah. And they would say to me that you are blah, 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 blah. And like, we're having this whole, and I cried, and they yelled, and they yelled, and I cried, and then this whole thing, right, back and forth between two people, and it's all fabricated in your mind, right? You're sitting here guessing through the uncertainty and indeterminacy of reality, 
And meanwhile, if you just walked up to them, they would suddenly put on this bright smile, shake your hand, and say, "Hey, how you doing today?" And you're like, "Oh, you mean I just went through an entire mental circus for nothing? I produced that entire role play game where I played both sides of the chess match between me and the other person, and it really was based on nothing." Yeah. I was so planning on having an argument with my boss when I got into work today. I thought about it all night. I dreamt of what I, what I would say. And then he was nice to me. It's bizarre, right? How can you do that? Right? So that's, that's, the, that's the snake. And the snake's venom is in its head, in the mouth. It means, it means to say that it, it poisons you at the beginning of any process. Right? It starts you out, and it all starts at the beginning of mental processes before it actually becomes real. As opposed to the scorpion, where's the scorpion's poison? Tail. And it's at the tail end, so that would be the end of any process. Wow. Right? So there's another way in which I can get uh, stung. In fact, the word akravim comes from the word akev. That's the, one of the roots that's embedded in that four letter uh, Hebrew root. It's a four letter Hebrew root, but one of the clearest words that comes out of it is the, the word heal, because it comes at, it stings you in the heel, the end of any process, when I'm about to complete it. Very often I have this with my students' papers. I teach at NYU, so when they, when they want to hand in you know, the term paper, whatever it might be, right? it's like, I just need a few more days. Another footnote, another revision, if you will. Uh, so I say, you know, being the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, get it into me next Tuesday, right? And they're like, okay, uh, and I get an email on Tuesday. Uh, well, I'm still working on it, <laughs> meditating intensively. I'm like, okay, sometime over the summer, if you please, right? You know, the, anytime this millennium, right? You know, eventually, right? It, it's dragging out because they don't want to fit. Because always the heel that stings you at the end says, don't cross that finish line. It will be over. Right? You have to continue delaying and procrastinating and always fearing like whatever you produce is never good enough, right? Because uh, if we're perfectionists, we may actually sting ourselves with this poison that says, no matter what I've done is never going to be good enough because I have such an incredible expectation that prevents me. If I'm not going to win the Pulitzer for this paper, I'm not handing it in. <laughs> That's the bottom line. I want a Pulitzer, or I'm not handing it in, and I, I really just don't think, even after seven and a half years, it's a Pulitzer piece yet. We're working, right? We're working. So these are the these are the snakes and scorpions. So we have these two different uh, possibilities. We have either you can fill your mind with positive things, or you can fill your it, automatically it empties out. But empty doesn't mean literally empty. It means that empty brings about these uh, demonic or negative psychic phenomena that we call snakes and scorpions that will fill the pit of the mind. Likewise, it says whenever someone's trying to break an addiction. It's not enough to just uh, take out and empty your consciousness of the thing that you're trying to get away from, that which you are addicted to. Uh, you have to replace it. In other words, the way to get rid of the snakes and scorpions is to fill the pit with water, not just to try to empty the pit, because the empty pit will always keep attracting back snakes and scorpions. Uh, say that a little bit differently. If you're trying to, uh, say, quit smoking, very often people will say, don't just take away the cigarette, you have to replace it with like exercise or chewing gum or something like that to fill the void. Because nature abhors a void. You can't have a real void even in your consciousness. Another way that this is put sometimes has to do with a wonderful passage in the book of Psalms, which is sur me rabbe ase tov. Go away from the negative or from the evil and to do good. So uh, there's a very interesting uh, reading of that that comes from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He says, Sur me ra al yedei ase tov. Go away from the negative by just doing good. If you're so involved with good things, you have no time for the not good. Right? If I'm so busy exercising, I have no time to smoke. Whatever it might be, right? I filled that empty space so I can't contemplate the negative. If I'm too busy doing meaningful, purposeful, happy things, I can't have, be, have time to contemplate my anxiety. There's just no time for it. Right? So that's why, that's why traditionally rabbis would try to fill their day with 20 hours of learning or whatever it might be, because they have no time then to get into trouble. Otherwise, it's, you know, hitting the casinos. There's just no other time, you know, like, one or the other, right? I have to fill my time somehow. So it's the only way to keep me out of trouble is just to learn these lots of these books and so on as we go. And those are the two, those are the two seemingly uh, possibilities, discrete possibilities that come up in this particular level of anxiety. So that's ignoring the anxiety. We're told that very often uh, Hesek Adat, that uh, very interesting things happen when you're not paying attention, one of which is Mashiach comes. The Messiah will come. Redemption comes very often when you're not even uh, expecting it. So sometimes if you get your mind off of whatever is bothering you, the source of anxiety, 
you'll find when you're not thinking about what's bothering you, the source of the problem so much, because you're involved in positive things, that suddenly you realize redemption came. That, that, that source of your trouble dissipated automatically. Whether if I try to actively get rid of the negative, so I get involved in the dark, ugly things in life. So I may never like break free of them in order to get to the light, to the happy things. But if I just immediately go for the happy things in the light, then automatically I'm not dealing with the dark. Right? That's, that's, that's a fundamental uh, shift in thinking in terms of how to deal with uh, ignoring something or avoiding it. Right? It's not just to avoid it by itself, but avoiding it by replacing it, really. So what is the third level of anxiety? What is the third level of reading this verse, rather, to treat the anxiety, the third stage in our therapy? Well, it's not surprising that it's uh, somewhat Freudian. And that has to do with the, another reading. It says, Daga Balevish, anxiety in the heart of man. Yesichena le'acharim, the Talmud tells it. To speak about it to other people. Talk therapy, in other words. That's what you need. You need some talk therapy. Talk about, well, you know, I've been experiencing some anxiety. Let me tell you about it. Do you have a few days? <laughs> right? So you, like, you go through and you explain the whole anxiety at length. And where do we see this? What is the ultimate uh, guidebook to psychological talk therapy? That would be the book of Job, right? Uh, if yeah, anyone yeah. had anxiety, <laughs> he's the archetype, right? Job. So Sefer Eov deals with all of this uh, anxiety. In fact, in one of his conversations to God, he even accused God of having a, a ta'ut Freudian, a Freudian slip. And what was that? He says, God, my name is Eov. Do you think you, you might have said by accident when you sent your Satan, your, your Satan and adversary against me, Oyev? Oyev and Eov are the same letters, just two letters are mixed up in the middle. Eov means Job. Oyev means my enemy. So he said, God, did you maybe say Oyev instead of Eov? Because I'm Eov, and I'm getting the mail from Oyev. <laughs> Unsubscribe right now. I don't want it. Return to sender. <laughs> Enough. So basically, the structure of the book of Job is set up where you have five therapy sessions. This is the book of talk therapy, if there ever was one in the Torah. And the five therapists are divided into uh, two camps. First of all, there's the three friends of Eo that come to him and psychoanalyze him uh, in the beginning of the book. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Sofer. Okay, the three friends. They show up. Each one represents a different school of psychotherapy. Uh, Eliphaz is a behavioral psychologist. He's been reading a lot of Skinner. Uh, then you have uh, uh, Bildad. He's a, an emotional intelligence guy. He reads Coleman, uh, Goldman. And then you have, uh, uh, finally, Zofer, uh, uh, who is a uh, cognitive psychotherapist. He reads Beck. And, and all these guys, each one of them is got their different school, and so they analyze him based on his behavior, his emotional states, or his intellectual processing, his cognitive processes, vis-a-vis -vis the trauma and the anxiety, the suffering. Each one has a little bit of success, but that, that doesn't like tell the whole tale. There's still more sessions to be had, and we get to then the enigmatic fourth therapist, whose name is Aliu ben Brachel. And we're told that Aliu ben Brachel is actually one of the images, one of the classic uh, personifications of the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, Mashiach. And part, one of the reasons for that it has to do with uh, the fact that his name in Hebrew, Eliyahu, it's not Eliyahu, it's actually just a little bit different. Elihu ben Brachel, his name, if you add up the letters in Hebrew, has numbers, equals 358, which is the equivalent of Mashiach, the Messiah. Now what's even more striking is the word Mashiach, the word Messiah, besides having to do with anointment and a number of other things, uh, the word Mashiach means Messiah, which means a speaker. So there's a concept from Rebbe Nachman of Bressel that when the Messiah shows up, we're going to all talk to one another. It's a talk therapy session. So this fourth therapist is actually represents messianic psychology. That's one of his images. And he has the fourth therapy session with Job. And what's incredible about that is that Lent gives us a heads up that when we're finally redeemed, we're going to be sitting as a people on one enormous couch in the holy city of Jerusalem, and we're going to be talking to our therapist, <coughs> Mashiach, 
and we're going to and we're going to be asking him about all of the residual trauma of 2,000 years of exile, and he's going to have to explain it all to us, everything that we do. Going through our and like why Brooklyn and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> we'll have to, all that will have to be explained, like right, much later. Much malts. We'll have to explain all of these very deep, dark secrets in Jewish history. So uh, that that's that's stage number four. But even that is not the final tale because in the very end of the book of Job, there is a fifth therapist that arrives, which is none other than God Himself. And God and you know have the following rap session. God asks or poses to Job. Uh, 50 existential questions about the nature of life and reality. And they have this whole grand interchange, that that's the ultimate conversation that occurs in this book. So there are a total of five therapists. Three of them have to do with his cognitive, emotive, or behavioral modes of being. And two more that have to do with either the messianic or directly tapping into the divine, unmediated with this therapy session with God at the end. So it, the Kabbalists tell us that these five therapy sessions are, are personified by these five figures that are there outside of Eov. But ultimately, they represent five voices that come from within him that each therapist is speaking out of a different level of his own soul, out of Job's own soul. There are five different gradations of the soul. They're called Neran Chai, or Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chayel, Yechida. And we'll, it, all of those loosely translate to soul. The Nefesh, the lowest level, is the root of the soul that cleaves to the body and imbues the body with its ability to act and is most bound up with what we call behavioral psychology. The second level, the Ruach, is the level of the soul that is seated in the heart and is the root of our emotive intelligence or our general emotive states. The level above that, the neshama, sits in the mind and would be the realm of all of our cognitive experience. So those are the three lower levels of the soul. They're all called levels of the soul that are pnimim. They're internalized, they're localized in different reaches of the body. Sometimes we say that the behavioral level is in the gut, right, or the liver even. That's, that's where it hits you. It's, it's below the mind and the heart, the gut or the liver. And then above that in the heart, and then above that in the mind. So each of those three soul levels are on equal footing with the person in the body, as it were, because they're all installed locally within the body. So those are the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Sofer of Eov. That's why they're called friends. Then this strange figure that comes kind of from above and beyond, he's a somewhat transcendental element in the soul, which is called the Chaya, it means the living one. Is, the, is one of the images of the Messiah. The, the, there's a part of the soul called Chaya, and the root of the word, the stem, is Chai, life. But if you look at the word the Mashiach, you can break it into two words, which is Shem Chai. The same four letters that spell the word Messiah in Hebrew can spell Shem Chai, the name of the living one. There's the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, and then there's the, you could say, Baal Shem Chai, the one, master of the name of life. So that's one of the secrets of the word Mashiach, and it relates to this level of Chaya. And we're told that each and every one of us, that we have this fourth level of our soul, that contained within that level of soul is a way of expressing really the highest level, the fifth highest level, which is the root of the Messianic soul. But sometimes it practically expresses itself in life through the Chaya, <coughs> this lower level, and that's how Mashiach ex speaks out from that particular soul level to Job, to Job, and that would be like messianic counseling and, and therapy for anxiety. But it's also a kind of talk therapy. And that kind of talk therapy can reveal very interesting things that you wouldn't normally deal with, like regressing you back, not just in utero, but into, let's say, previous lifetimes. So that's actually one of the things that the Ramban, Nachmanides, says about Job. If you are looking at his commentary on the book of Job, he says that there are certain aspects to it that you can't possibly understand from the normative scope of his life. You have to regress back further to figure out who he was in a previous lifetime. And that information is all ultimately filled in by the Arizal, the great Kabbalist whose day of passing was the fifth of the month of Av this last Friday, uh, who lived in 16th century Sfat. 
uh, the Arizal says that Eov, Job, was a reincarnation of Tarach, the father of Abraham. Mm. Tarach was an idol-worshipping father of Abraham, and therefore all of the saurus, all of the travail of Job, was ultimately a tikkun, a rectification for this previous life experience as Tarach. It was all being able to expiate and uh, work through that that earlier elements that had to be removed. But if you didn't know that, if you didn't regress to that state, obviously you need an, a, even a cognitive psychotherapist isn't going to get you that far back. You have to go to the, the Mashiach psychologist who's already like parapsychologist taking you beyond your psyche into another realm entirely to explain something in, in deep history that you may not have access on your own. Finally, the last level when God speaks to Job is the Yechida. Yechida means singularity. It's the point in which our soul is an Helech Elokai Mamal Mamash, is an actual part of God above, meaning there's really no absolute distinction ontologically at the level of our being between God's being and our being at the level of Yechida. We're at one. It's a singular entity. It collapses the distinction between the finite and the infinite. They come together. Every one of us, that's, that's the part of me that descended down from, in, from, from God. So the Yechida within every one of us can actually be the source of prophecy. It's as though it's like God within me speaking to me. So the, the, like the voice of the, of the godly, of the divine within me that speaks out, that can even be like a kind of prophetic sense of psychology that ex explain the largest scope of, of what's going on. That's the ultimate uh, insight that can come to self. And that also can help alleviate anxiety tremendously if I get that kind of divine inspiration as we might call it and that's something immediately accessible within the realm of one's own soul if I tap into my gut I'm thinking through my behavior if I tap into my heart I'm looking for emotive answers if I tap into my mind I'm looking for cognitive answers to speak to me to be in conversation to dialogue regarding my anxiety if I'm tapping into higher transcendent regions, I might be thinking into the messianic consciousness of my condition. And the highest level is really to become divinely inspired in some way, to understand the ultimate root of my own soul as something bound up with God. In a certain sense, that may mean recognizing whatever is going on to me is ultimately what God created. And so I have to embrace God, whether God produces a, a film that I enjoy or not. Like if I said, this movie, yeah, I'm not so sure. <laughs> right? You know, maybe set it back and uh, have it re-edited, right? Something <laughs> like that. And we're not uh, audience response. But since you made it, God, and I'm living in it, so I'm going to take the good times and the not so good times. I realize that each one is here to teach me some lesson because it all comes back to you. Ultimately, you, you take it back to the producer, right? Who started the whole show, right? Whatsoever. So everything lands on God's desk. In, in, in the end, and it's all from you. And this really is all you. I, like, I'm taking part in something which is you, and you make up me, and you make up the whole adventure. So what is that coming to tell me? So that's obviously the highest order conversation that you can possibly have, and that's what Job is trying to, to learn through the 50 questions that are posed to him that incidentally relate to what are called nun shari bina, 50 gates of understanding. Yeah. One of the secrets of 50 Gates of Understanding that is explained in the commentary of the Ravid on Sefer Yitzir from 900 years ago is that each question in the book of Job in one-to-one -one correspondence relates to another gate of understanding. And each of those gates, he explained, relate to one of the 50 references to God taking us out of Egypt in the Torah. Wow. There's a lot of repetition in the Torah. Why does it say 50 times, I, I God, am taking you out of Egypt? So each time, every going out of Egypt is being released from a restricted zone to a relatively more expansive zone. So every question triggers a release. The more I interrogate myself about the true nature of life and reality, the more I'm able to open those gates and it go to more expansive, more liberated states of consciousness in terms of myself and my own life. And that itself will ameliorate the severity of my anxiety. So those are the three different distinct levels that we experience. So going through them from top to bottom, we had, if I have anxiety, I lower the anxiety lest it lower me by lowering my sense of self, my self-expectations. 
Sometimes we do that in very unusual ways. You want a practical tip how to do it? Look at King David. King David, we're told, is the most sh shafel. He's a shval ruach, shiflut. This means fallenness, or like in Yiddish for fallen. A, lo a, lo a lowliness that a person may have, right? Feeling like uh, I'm doing one of those trust falls, where you stand at the top of the ladder and you hope that your friends in the class are going to catch you as you fall backwards, and of course they drop you and it hurts your head. <laughs> it's a terrible thing. But you do, you do one of those trust falls and you feel like my whole life I'm falling and just at the last minute God lifts me up. It says, Somech Hashem kolen no flim. God lifts up all that are feeling fallen in their life. So if I'm feeling fallen vis vis all my expectations, all my plans, my, my sum total portfolio, my identity, it all seems to be falling apart, but God lifts me up and catches me. So we learn that from King David. In fact, we even see that King David has another wonderful way of taking a, a serious, overly attached sense of self and turning it back into I'm like nothing, like lo chashuv, not so important, right? So he's the king. You might think the king would have be uh, suffering from tremendous megalomania being the king, right? Well, maybe if you're Elvis, you... So, no, but but the, that's not the kind of king he was. He's a Jewish king. He starts the Jewish, authentic Jewish monarchy. And what we see about King David is that the Zohar tells us that he was Badhan de Malka. He, he was God's comedian. King David was God's comedian. And, and, and what does that say? So that even God gets a little ang anxious sometimes. Are these my people? Again, are they really doing this to me? Again? <laughs> I send them down there. I give them a Torah. I send them on a mission. They'll run around. I don't know. They, 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 what is going on? Are these people are crazy. You know? Like, it's totally nuts. Uh, and uh, so God gets uptight. So it says King David would, would become like uh, the king's fool or gesture. And it, the image is when he took the ark up to Jerusalem, he was in such a, a state of joy that he acted like the lunatic in front of the king. He would actually do somersaults and backflips and in, in the pike position, not in the pike position, four flips. <laughs> he, uh, he was he was winning Olympic gold in the gymnastic competition in his joy before God, acting like the king's fool. And it says it would make God laugh, according to the Zohar. It would get us to laugh. Is the divine comedy in a very different sense? So th this, this, this is a quality that the king would have in a sense. The king can make fun of himself, can have a sense of humor, can make God laugh. Ah, oh, that's, that's a tremendous sense of being able to stand back for a moment and whatever role I take, I'm the king of something. I'm the CEO. I, I'm the grand high exalted mystic ruler. I'm the self-appointed commissioner of reality. Whatever it may be, I'm able to stand out from that as though I'm having an out-of-body experience, but it's really not an out-of-body experience. It just feels like that and say that, oh, isn't that kind of funny? You know, because relative to God, and all whatever we try is like really quite small on some level. So that's not vis-a-vis -vis one another necessarily, although it's good to have a, a sense of humor before other people. In fact, the Talmud tells us that uh, Elijah, Eliyahu, visited a certain town square, and the, the rabbi was speaking to him, and Elijah pointed out a, uh, two Jews that were standing in the distance, and he said, those two will get Olam Haba, the world to come. So the rabbi wanted to know, well, I wonder what they did, what amazing mitzvah to get Olam Haba. So he walks over to them and he taps them on the shoulder and he says, tell me, what did you do that uh, you should merit the world to come? In which they tell him, oh, we're, we're comedians. Very strange. What do you mean? You get the world to come just by being a comedian? Well, I guess a lot of Jews are getting the world to come. There are a lot of Jewish comedians <laughs> out there. Right? It's a very interesting <laughs> thing. If I, so that's what they do, making other people laugh is a tremendous quality. And that, and that, in a certain sense, has to, you have to let go a little bit of that self-image, that self-consciousness that we create. And being very tied to the self-image and the self-consciousness can actually make me lose my sense of humor. I might have been bored without a sense of humor. I might be struggling, compromise sense of humor. But definitely what it develops is an ability to, to, to like release, to let go. And that, there, there you feel the tension drop. So from there, we said that you can go to the level of the anxiety uh, ignoring by simply replacing it. If you're, if you're finding you're, you're dealing with a lot of anxiety, sometimes you just got to shift gears, go and pursue something else. And last, you can have all these wonderful talk therapy sessions that are possible. And uh, one of the ways we do that is we look for examples of uh, psychologists uh, in the Torah, and it's no accident that the, one of the ultimate dream interpreters that we have in Jewish tradition 
is Yosef. Yeah. And if you look at Yosef, his name is spelled Yud Vav Samik Pei. But the two letters Yud and Vav are considered like vowel letters, according to Hebrew grammar. So the two principal letters of his name are just Samik and Pei, or Samik and Fei, which uh, stands for Sigmund Freud. <laughs> and, of course, and when you, this is very interesting, our talk therapy, right? When you lie down on the couch, right? So a couch in Hebrew is called a sapa, the root of which is just Sam McFay or Sigmund Freud. So when you lie on the sapa, the sofa in Hebrew, you're actually lying down on the Sigmund Freud. Right. So Freud is now the therapist and the couch. <laughs> you know that, right? But see, as soon as you think of that, as soon as you realize that the therapist is the very couch that you're lying on, therefore it's so comical that you possibly can't take your anxiety seriously and you feel happy, which is the end of our statement. It says, Udvar tov yasamchena, and a good word will make a person glad. Right. And even the, the, the word yasamchena, to become glad, yismach, that he will make those happy, Yismach is the same letters of Mashiach. One of the permutations of the word for Messiah in Hebrew, Yismach is the same letters as Mashiach. Yismach is Lashen Simcha, which means joy, happy and joy. So we're waiting for happy to arrive. It come right now. Maybe we'll take it for some questions, and thank you very much. Speechless. Yeah. Rabbi. Huh? Question. Yes. You mentioned NYU. Yes. Which is near Cooper University where I teach occasionally. What, what do you do there? Uh, I'm doing my doctorate in, in philosophy. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. Yes. Okay, so to fill our pit with recording pursuits to reduce the level of anxiety. Yes. Where does the role of television come? Where, where is the role of television? Okay, so uh, regarding many of these new media, internet, television, radio, uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe said that these are not neutral, but undeniably good new phenomena in the world. I was thinking that, that, that doesn't mean to say that, that, uh, that they are always used for the best thing. But their potential is, uh, is unquestionably good. The, the, the television now can deliver the four corners of the world into your living room, if it need be. It can become an incredible educational tool. But it, it, it depends how you relate to it. Obviously, everyone now acknowledges in, in all of the different fields of education that if you watch television in a passive way, it can be very harmful because like alcohol, it's absorbed directly into the bloodstream without being filtered in any way. So you're being taken for a ride. And you may be taken into some very negative places where there are escape, snakes and scorpions. Uh, there are people like Michael Medvin, a radio commentator and former movie critic who talk about Hollywood as the poison factory. And television is not always any better. That you, you can have a lot of very negative images that people embrace. At the same time, uh, an active engagement to be involved in critical thinking, to be a film critic, a TV critic, like even if you're just an amateur or, uh, or passive uh, uh, or uh, un, un, uh, uh, not, not uncommon, but like uh, infrequent watcher of TV or whatever it may be, you're, you're not a professional, <laughs> that you uh, engage whatever you are consuming, whether it be radio, TV, movies, and you agree in an active critical and say, well, what message is really coming out for this? Is this something like the Torah? Is this something opposed to the Torah? That's a very different scenario. Uh, at the same time, what's called the sleeper curve uh, that is uh, beautifully documented in a book called Everything Bad for You is Good for You uh, by Mike jo and Mark Johnson, the uh, editor of Wired Magazine, talks about how TV is getting increasingly more sophisticated. Uh, and that what once would uh, serve as entertainment with a very simple, straightforward, start to finish narrative would never work today. And that uh, uh, episodes of shows like Seinfeld may have 13 different uh, plot uh, threads running right. through them that may sometimes cover the course of six seasons. Like, it'll tell a joke in season six that you have to watch season one and remember it to get the joke. 
right. right? It carries over. For, so the complexities are picking up. Like people are now demanding more sophisticated television, and thank God Jews are producing it for them. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is happening uh, increasingly. So w w we have yet to see the full potential of television arrive, what it can really do as a medium, but it has the potential to be very profound in its, in its positive impact. It hasn't necessarily done that at all. But it, it, it depends how we decide to approach it and engage it. it. There's no positive impact in television. It takes this bad behavior all day long. The movies and the television. And again, as a general rule, it, it can definitely be like there can also, you can watch, uh, we brought out to Philadelphia recently, Brian Green, who's a, a world-renowned string theorist. You could watch his Nova special and talking about yes. string theory and learn something new in a realm of science. I, I, again, it, 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 there's a difference between this as a tool and the content that we upload on that tool. Most of the content, I agree, is a total, no, is total, total, total waste of time. But that's not, that's not to say that you can't use the self-same tool in an incredibly powerful way to provide all kinds of educational components. And there are some who do that. There are elements of that. But it, ha it, it still has a long way to go. Uh, but I in addition to just the content itself, there's also m how I view this medium, how I come to it. Am I coming passively or actively? You can have the same, I mean, in a certain sense, it's less difficult, uh, um, it, well, w with reading books, for instance. You can be passive reader of a book, but usually book requires more active engagement than TV. Most people would usually agree with that type of statement, but everything from books to magazines to TV to radio require active involvement, the ability to critique, to think about on a secondary level of reflection what one is. So I did uh, a study continue. that by the time a child's bar mitzvah, he's seen 52,000 murders on television. Yeah, no, the, 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 uh, the statistics are unbelievable. And, and even with, with that, uh, alongside that, there, there are something like 50% more murders on TV than there are in real life. <laughs> it's like much, much higher uh, type of thing. I, I teach film theory and I talk about the television. We'll sometimes take a program and, uh, or, or some uh, series or something and we'll analyze it and break it down into its component parts and even like uh, micro analyze a, secrets, uh, a sequence of scenes and talk about why are you experiencing the emotional reactions that you are from these images. You don't even know this person. They're not even real and you're crying. Why, why are you doing that? Why are you getting up? You can't kill Harry Potter? You know, whatever it might be, right? Like, there's all these types of things that people get very involved in. Why is that? We need to try to understand that phenomenon. And, and it, even to make children aware of it, that like you, you really, are you driving the, the, the chariot or are you being taken for a ride? Which, which, which is going on in this particular case? Yeah. Just one, um, uh, one, yes. one quick thing. Yes. Every television program, yes. in the middle they put advertisements. Why is that? Because no one's going to watch advertisements. <laughs> right. So this is a really yeah, great yeah. television program right now. We actually have the camera. <laughs> we have all your <laughs> So Rabbi Chris, I hope you won't mind. I have a few advertisements. We will be back after these commercials. Right. Okay. Okay. Just, just a moment. Go. Now that we have everyone's attention, we have some upcoming exciting events. The Kosher Cruise will be on the Crystal Queen uh, August 5th. There are 150 places on that boat. There's 150 life jackets. That's all. So we ask you to uh, re um, RSVP beforehand. How do you do that? You call the Chabad office, speak to Linda, and uh, when the checks are here or the credit card number is over the, given over the phone, then you're officially uh, signed up and you don't want to miss this. It's, we're going to sing, we're going to dance, we're going to eat, we're going to do everything Jewish. <laughs> August 26th is going to be the Jewish Summerfest. The courtyard outside between the JCC and the Chabad House has turned into a, a festival with rides and kosher food and entertainment and to bring yourselves, bring your family, bring your friends, bring kids of all ages, all ages, uh, will enjoy this. August 26th. Last, my last uh, commercial is uh, Chabad's going to print with our Jewish art calendar for the year uh, five, seven, six, eight. It's going. We are going to print at the end of this week. Those who would like to put a yard side in or a birthday in, uh, you will be supporting our wonderful work in the community 
and also getting an advertisement or putting a yard site in. You could uh, put business ads in on top. Please, we ask you to be generous with these ads. And again, call the Chabad House, call the, the office, Linda, 822-8500, you know, the number. And now, back to our feature presentation. All right. <laughs> Turning back okay. yes, there we go, yes. <laughs> um, which level of the soul does intuition come from? Uh, okay, uh, in general, the word we have uh, that best describes intuition in Hebrew is chokhmah. Uh, it's very often described as, as uh, wisdom, but the English word wisdom doesn't catch all the nuances, particularly because chokhmah is very often linked to the concept of ri'iyah, that wisdom is like a kind of visual process. It's a, it's a pre-linguistic visualization of concepts, which is better described or translated as intuition that has that kind of optical uh, dimension to it. So, but which level of the soul? Oh, sorry, level of the soul. I don't know. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, I, I was assuming you know, because the, all, all the different powers of the soul parallel uh, levels of the soul. So the way it works, Malchut, line, this is for people who have a little more background, Malchut lines up with Nefesh, Zeranpin, which is all of the Midot, the emotions from Chesed to Yesod, is uh, Ruach, right. Bina, which is understanding, lines up with Neshama, Hochma lines up with Chaya. So, uh, okay, so that's what Chaya, I the living level of the soul, the fourth from below, okay. or the second so the highest so the from above. So the Messiah, level, yeah, that has to do with vision uh, in terms of uh, in, in, intuition, okay. intuition or <coughs> state. So that's even above the cognitive, because the cognitive is right. already involved in the in the logic matrices of the mind, right. and sure. intuition is able to ascend or transcend beyond that. Yes. Wonderful. Right. Okay. Uh, if we wanted to go into a much more nuanced analysis, we definitely could bring that into play. Uh, in general, the lowest level, what we call the nephish, is the level of soul that's enclosed within the body. And the question of what is the r relationship between the soul proper and its r registering of psychological states, which before we described as behavioral psychology and that which is totally on a bodily level. Uh, in general, the way it's described is a, a, a small hole in the neshama, in the soul, will result in a large hole in the body, meaning that there is a psychosomatic or psychospiritual root to all physiological developments. And so, too, from a bottom-up type of approach, the body can be tapped in different ways and manipulate it through chemistry and other, uh, other types of uh, techniques to uh, influence the soul from below. Like uh, we see very clearly that certain uh, medicines, in fact, has been one of the most successful fields of psychology. But in general, the, that type of approach would be likened to weeding in your garden where you're, just up, where you're just pulling out the weeds from the surface up. You're not necessarily getting to the roots. It more suppresses symptoms than to get into the real root of the of the issue and to deal with it at its at its spiritual plane. It's totally acceptable. And in fact you might even begin there, but it may not be the end of a process. So in a certain sense it's tied to nef the nefesh, the lowest of the five levels. And it's tied to it the way it's the lower half of that level of the soul, which is more intimately bound up with the body. That overlap between body and soul at the lowest level. So behavior would be like the top half of the lowest level and the, the chemical, uh, pharmaceutical uh, approach in psychiatric medicine would be the bottom half. So all of those are definitely tapped in and just each one has its own internal consistent logic or intelligibility as a therapeutic practice for dealing with these types of elements. Interestingly, it's also about a conversation. What we described yesterday in our class with stem cell research is that stem cells represent the cell of all cells that is fluent in the intercellular language. It can speak that language fluently because the way of seeing dialogue happening on a cellular level is the, the, the words, the speech patterns, are all the molecules that are exchanged from one cell to the next. So in a certain sense, pharmaceuticals and all drug companies, we mentioned this yesterday, create uh, uh, medicines that learn how to speak a word or phrase or sentence or maybe even a paragraph if they're incredibly sophisticated 
of the intercellular language. So it's also a kind of talk therapy. It's getting different bodily parts to talk to one another. So that's just a different way of framing it. So definitely we would include that in the talk therapy classification. Just, it, it's, it's the body talk. And hopefully it's wireless. Yes. <laughs> can, you, can you comment on something that we, um, Ira and I were at a uh, yoga center this week, and the woman that was one of the featured speakers mm -hmm. was somebody who pioneered, uh, a Jewish woman, by the way, who worked at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York yes. alongside um, physicians who were doing open heart or transplants, actually. Yes. And she uses the energy yes. from her own body mm -hmm. to communicate to the patient while the surgeon is performing the open heart surgery. Okay. That, that's a huge new field uh, of study. It's actually existed for quite some time, and there's been a number of Jewish contributions to it. Uh, one of the areas that relates to this is the field of uh, subtle energy research. Uh, William uh, uh, Tiller, who is a professor, former professor at Stanford University and featured in the movie What the Bleep Do We Know, is one of the foremost uh, researchers on the physical level of that type of science, but uh, you also find it uh, uh, in the realm of what's called biophotonics, where there's a, an electromagnetic field that surrounds the body that now can be seen that is augmented through it, like what we is commonly called or properly called energy healings or, or energy sculpting that you might, uh, you might find. Uh, so that's an increasingly uh, important topic of interest to even more mainstream researchers. Uh, and that can fall under a variety of different categories depending upon how it's being described. In, in classical literature, especially in the more occult realm, the reading of auras and things that were at once viewed as fictive to, to mainstream science is now being entertained increasingly. In fact, there's a whole study of these kinds of uh, effects vis-a-vis -vis, uh, projections of intention and consciousness that's uh, being directed by a Jewish Nobel Prize winner at Cambridge University, in fact, right now. So uh, it's, the field is very much uh, opening its horizons in terms of possibilities. Yes? <coughs> um, I, I was just curious to know if you ever heard of this. My son received a book in the mail, and it said that all Jews should be going back to Jerusalem. And I didn't know whether that had I figured if it had any validity, all the Jewish rabbis would be discussing it. And I thought maybe it was propaganda. They're trying to get rid of us and get us to go back. <laughs> 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 no. Real estate agents. OK, so there, there's a wonderful concept that comes from the third of the Lubavitcher uh, Rebbeim in the Chabad dynasty, known as the Tzemot Tzadik. And he talked about Makhda Eretz Yisrael which is make wherever you are uh, the land of Israel. And, and so when we moved from Israel, we, live in we lived in Jerusalem for almost nine years. When we moved there to Philadelphia, uh, we live in the city of Marion, outside of Philadelphia. So we don't say Marion, we say Marone, which is where Rabbi Shimon <laughs> <laughs> It's near, it's near Ar Ardmore, which we say Admore, <laughs> which is the name for a Rebbe. In the, in the we change it, in other words, I view it as greater Israel. And that, that's the idea of make wherever you are the land of Israel, which means that you are now enveloped in an environmental condition where everywhere you walk, you're conscious of this is the land of Israel. Everything that I do is tied to some mitzvah, some uh, commandment, or some relationship that I'm, I'm playing out now here between me and, and the Creator. That's, that's part of it. And it says in the future, the land of Israel will encompass the whole world. Right? That's one of the ideas. Uh, even right now, according to the Bali Tosafot and the Talmud, the borders of the true land of Israel extend all the way out to the French Riviera. So by now, before <laughs> other people find out, uh, it, 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 it depends how you define it. So obviously, there is great, there is great uh, greatness to going to the physical land of Israel <clears throat> as it's defined right now. But that's not the only way of understanding it. Definitely, there's multitudes of levels. And that's why you won't hear everyone advocating that uh, right now, like, with, that uh, you need to try to create your own, you should visit the real Jerusalem, but you also have to create your own Jerusalem wherever you are. And that's it's very important to acknowledge that there's, there's multiple levels of understanding this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you respond to this comment? Um, Orthodox Judaism is the only uh, uh, real Judaism. 
So uh, I, I, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll say that first this uh, Orthodox Judaism is another one of those categories that that circumscribes a whole eclectic bunch of people. For instance, you find that there are Orthodox Jews that that uh, like will serve in the Israeli army. There are those who won't serve in the Israeli army. There's people who are pro-state of Israel, negative state of Israel. There are those who participate in the whole world and trying to draw all the Jewish people together, and those who huddle closely together and don't want to have to do with anything with the rest of the world. So, what category does that uh, do, do? Does that really imply one homogenous thing? Sometimes, what we mean by orthodox, and if this is what you mean, is an idea that all of Jewish tradition and text, the whole the whole of it, has a a divine character to it that you can't crack that integral unity and just revise it at will. That when I read something, and this is a, a common reading strategy, because this could mean many things, but it's interesting. If I approach a text, if it's just any book, if it's uh, you know uh, Kafka or James Joyce or Proust or whatever it might be, right? Stephen King, Harry Potter, I don't know, whatever it is, right? They're all on the same camp, right? Okay, so you, you put, you, you approach the text, I read it, and I say, you know, this doesn't make sense. So now I have two choices. I can either assume that the author is Meshuggah and that I know better than the author, and this, eh, what I'm reading makes no sense, and I will abort the process of reading at that point because I can now just be dismissive. Or, if I have a case with the Torah, I can say, you know what, there's something, a treasure here. And if I don't see it, it's because I'm not looking deeply enough in it. And I'm going to struggle with the text. I will not prematurely surrender. I will struggle with the text until I pull out that deep meaning. It may mean that I work on it my whole life. And, but that, that allows me to have a, an, a, an indefinite attachment to that text and preserve its unity. And I, I'm, in a certain sense, reading with the, the her hermeneutical directive that I have to read until I see everything uh, comes out that it has internal consistency and it's true. And those are the types of questions I need to be asking. So I'm going to approach the text fundamentally different. So if that's what you mean by orthodox, so I guess there is like some definite claim of distinction that, that, that uh, surrounds that. Because there's no way that if you ha read with that in mind, and if you read without that in mind, that you're going to arrive at the same place. You'll come to very different conclusions about everything. And that does relate to a certain kind of internal consistency in terms of either like how I'm reading these texts, how I'm living this life, even though in the fine details you might see a lot of colors. That's a, bit, that's a, that's a big struggle. But uh, I, I think that sometimes we're so overly reductionistic in how we approach these questions that it's just not working. It creates a lot of conflict and we can't, we can't explain the conflict of interpretations so readily. So more than anything else, I urge people to really be willing to stay the course and to deeply invest yourself in learning more and more and more about these texts and traditions to become informed and so you can inherit it and that that tradition is living and can embrace all of the questions of the contemporary world. Very well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and the intimacy of that relationship. Uh, there's a wonderful title of a book of a, of a French Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, that is called God Who Comes to the Idea. God is ultimately, it says, the late Makshavat Hisbrei Klal, that no thought grasps God whatsoever. Like, as soon as you try to represent God as an idea, you've already shrunk something very small. Big God, little clothing. Right? Doesn't fit, you know, even with a belt. It's not going to work, right, at all. So, it, it, that, it, very often what we try to do is, instead of saying one specific idea that tries to capture the whole thing, instead we say that this is a lifelong study to pursue that question. And by and large, what you've just asked perhaps accurately describes what the learning of Hasidut is. Hasidic philosophy is an endless study, in fact, studying it on a daily basis, studying works like the Tanya, or many of the Hasidic discourses in the Quran, of the different uh, Rebbeim throughout ages, are all very long uh, engagements with the question that you've just asked. Some of them will last for thousands of pages, and went over years trying to embrace that question. And if anything, sometimes we say that Judaism is less about trying to precisely define God as a refusal of idolatry. And by a refusal of idolatry is an unwillingness to reduce God to any one particular thing. Some people want to want to deify love and say love is all there is. Love is all you need. It could be this, right? <laughs> so, uh, and others, on the other hand, said it's my sense of justice, right? Ways and means of appropriation and revenge, right? That, that uh, right? Uh, we're, we're going to do some repossession, right? And all these kinds of that's that's what setting the scales right, and, and they deify that. But that's all of them. So we learn about God's different attributes, and we say we pray to God and not to the attributes, much like we relate to a person and not to any one of their particular qualities. Like my wife is not married to my left elbow. She's not, she's not married to my shoe or to my ear. She's married to me, right? I, I am not just uh, the sum of my parts. So even though I may have many attributes that describe myself, not any one of them is exhaustive of the, of the whole thing. So there are intentions for prayer. Sometimes we focus in on specific qualities of, of Hashem, of God. But ultimately, the prohibition of making a graven image or set a record, I don't also be in your mind. What, whatever I say you are, I've immediately tried to say the unsayable. And so automatically I've said less than what there is to say. There's always some overflow or excess that spills beyond any attempt to totalize the divine in a single expression. So this is, this is I would encourage you, if that's your question, to, to, to set aside some time. I know there's some classes being given here. And, and, and the citizens, we've got to get the advertising plug in, correct? Right? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, know what I mean, know what I mean? Uh, and we'll get those we'll, we'll get those underway. All right, yes. So we to starting with traditional medical practice, dealing with alternative healing, uh, such as chiropractic, acupuncture, acupressure, naturopathy, homeopathy, all of those types of things. But then also talks about spiritual types of healing, and that many of the great Kabbalists, including the secret society of the Bali Shem, the masters of the name, you mentioned the number of divine names, that understood that every name, those letters have a kind of potency associated with that they are the, the, the place markers that, that carve up the universe in terms of divine energies that may be harnessed for healing or other positive effects. I, I and so th there's, a, there's a whole realm of study that definitely can be described. Sure. In general, all of the commandments have 
and there was this work called Sefer Paredin that was published in 1601 by one of the students of the Arizal uh, that, that goes through and explains which of the commandments are relevant to different parts of the body and how they may be applied to healing those specific parts of the body. So you can even like start to break down. In fact, the fact that the 248 positive commandments correspond to the 248 limbs, the way we do our anatomy in, in Jewish thought, so that there is some correlation between bodily parts or organs or bodily systems and specific elements within Jewish practice. So you're correct, but it's not just limited to those two. It's, you can, by extension, uh, for instance, just learning Torah. Torah is called Torah Chayim. It's the Torah of life. The, the, the mere learning of Torah can, can, uh, can help to heal a person. It says, David Amalek, as long as he learned the Torah, could not be taken by the Malach HaMavit. But that's another kind of radical life extension. Tor itself, <laughs> <laughs> Rita Yam Mim, is radical life extension. Tor to raise a level a little bit above the herbs. Right. Okay. So there's a, again, there's a, the multitude of, so that book kind of outlines the multitude of levels of approaches that can help them. Yes? Rabbi, I wonder if you could kind of bring all three of your lectures together. Uh, <laughs> you saved this last topic of anxiety, and again, inventions and we're not dealing with man's psyche yes. that we can truly make this this earth uninhabitable very quickly with the press of a button and could you sort of kind of tie that so that we can reach the Mashiach goal, have full life, have all diseases eradicated In, in the mechanical universe and have all the electronic uh, devices that anyone could ever imagine or aspire for, we have become largely alienated from our, our basic uh, healthy condition in terms of psychologically and spiritually around it. And there's a great return to that. As technology increases, there's a kind of revival of people who are searching answer a question that can't be answered by a machine, or can't be answered in losing myself in all of the various uh, uh, technological advancements of the world. So we actually hinted to this yesterday when we were talking in our stem cell class, that we said that while the objective status of disease, objective disease will be removed from the world, makala, all diseases will be eventually wiped out. So we'll still be left with the state that will be called holy, will be well, feeling subjectively, inwardly, psychospiritually sick. And the, the work that we really have to do, as much as like healing may improve in the medical field, is really trying to get in touch, and not just through medication, but what deep down is bothering us that we're not tapping into, that that kind of alienation is the original phenomena of exile that we talk about. We're, like we're a religion that harps a lot on if you can call it a religion, I'm speaking very uh, loosely as I talk. But the word galut prefigures so strongly in Jewish thought. Exile is like 
the dominant theme, whether it be the exile from the Garden of Eden, the exile into Egypt, the, the different exiles in Babylonia, in Medea, in, uh, in, in, amongst the uh, Hellenist period, now under the Roman, or really the, we the, the exile of Western civilization, and so on. And the latest component of that exile is we seem to be uh, exiled or displaced or disoriented or alienated amongst all of the uh, fanfare of the modern technological age. At the same time, though, people at, at a certain point it gets the the problem becomes so pronounced that people wake up and say, "Hang on, I got to do something about this. I got to figure out what's missing because I'm not being satisfied by buying another Palm Pilot or playing another video necessarily. I want to find." Something else. I, I, I want to, as Viktor Frankl would say, a search for meaning. And that's, that's definitely happening uh, increasingly, and I think that there's great promise in that. So if we can redirect our efforts, given the free time that can open up with the end of work that comes by robotics and the extended life that comes through stem cell research, and if we've evolved as a society where we put down our guns and put our money into education, and we start getting a new list of priorities, and we realize that, that, that the emphasis, which has been changing, more and more people go to secondary uh, level education. How many people went to college 50 years ago compared to today? There's no comparison. E education is growing. The number of years of education is growing. Adult education is growing. The democracy of education is growing. In fact, just this year, MIT, put all 1,600 of its courses, graduate and undergraduate, online for free. So there is uh, like somebody that with the pursuit of knowledge, including trying to understand the world and the self, is opening up. The fact that we're having a class and talking about Kabbalistic insights here, at, right in the shadow of Atlantic City, is an unprecedented type of event in Jewish history. The amount that could be allocated towards education, the amount of people that, that, could, that could be uh, freed up from their 16-hour workday of just trying to put food on the table, because we're all involved in agriculture at one point just to survive, th this has all changed. So the, the technology, while if we just get lost in it, can be very alienating. At the same time, it's freeing us up and evolving the world to the next state where people are suddenly, hey, I'm going to take, I'm going to go take classes at the Chabad house. I'm going to go listen to a lecture and try to, to find myself. I'm going to have the opportunities to pursue uh, creative outlets that were never afforded to previous generations. So as much as there are the negatives, I see overwhelming positivity in the general drift. Of course, there are setbacks. But as, as we spiral forward, there's like the epicycles that briefly go backwards, but in general, the thrust, I think, is an upward, upwardly positive thrust. What an end. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Rabbi Chris. We look forward to seeing you all at our many upcoming events. Grab a brochure on your way out. I'm in New York like twice a week. Oh, yeah, back up All to right, the ocean. What we say? What's the <laughs> uh, well, I I in Israel we'd say bamba. 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 Kids like bamba. Sounds like a bamba. Bamba. Hey, what's, the, what's the makeup, the spiritual bamba. makeup of cheese? Number one. Cheese. Wow. That's actually mentioned anytime. Oh, really? Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> 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 we are cute. <laughs>